Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this evening's webinar with Drs. David Grable and Brent Damer of Central Indiana Orthopedics. They will be discussing hip and knee pain and treatment options, including the latest surgical technology and joint replacement. Drs. David Grable and Brent Damer both specialize in hip and knee joint replacement and revision and are both certified in using MAKO robotic technology for hip and knee replacement. Dr. Grable has been practicing orthopedics for almost 30 years and has been with CIO since 2001. He works at CIO Fishers and Anderson offices. Dr. Damer has been practicing orthopedics for 13 years and has been with CIO since 2009. He works at CIO Muncie and Marion offices. Before we start the presentation, I want to go through a few housekeeping items. This presentation is being recorded and also live streamed on our Facebook page. All attendees will be muted throughout the entire presentation. At the end, attendees may submit questions by using the Q&A feature at the bottom of their screen. After the webinar, I will be sending out an email to all registered attendees so you will have my contact information for any follow-up questions. At this time, I will turn it over to Dr. Grable to begin the presentation. Thank you. Hi there. Um, again, I'm Dick Grable. My partner, Dr. Damer, is going to share this talk with me. I'm going to go ahead and start. Uh, I'm going to end up focusing a little bit on background of the uh, robotic uh, surgery that we're talking about, um, and then focus on hip arthritis, and he'll take over on knee. We both um, have practices pretty much exclusively in joint reconstruction, both hip and knee. Um, so we're both members of Central Indian Orthopedics. Our disclosures are here. Uh, I think the re relevant one in the striker is sponsoring this. Um, so here's um, a picture of our partners. Um, CIO is a well-established group. We basically are, are along the I-69 corridor, starting in Fishers and going up past Muncie. We have uh, three large clinics and several uh, satellite clinics, and the group was founded in 1950. We do have these joint replacement specialists in most aspects of orthopedics. We have walk clinics, and uh, feel free to check us out at some point. Um, next slide here is the surgeons um, certified on MAKO. Dr. Damon and I were the, the two that kind of pushed our group this direction. Um, and uh, we both do both hip and knee. Different people in, in the group uh, do perhaps only total knee, uh, several do both. Um, so you'd have to check that out again on our website. So people ask when we start talking about this, you know, what is a robotic uh, uh, MAKO total knee replacement, total hip replacement or partial replacement? Well, it's really a tool um, and it's, a, it's a, a tool that helps us with planning and execution of an individualized plan for the patient. So traditional hip or knee replacement, we have certain criteria that we try to put implants in a specific way, generally the same for every patient. And then once we have implants in, we examine how the joint would move and try to um, balance the knee or get the hip in the right position. So leg length is good, stability is good. Here, with these techniques, we obtain a CT before surgery. This is registered in the computer attached to the robot. And then once we open the knee or hip and register the bone, we can virtually move the joint through space and see if we do put the components in one position, what's the consequences. We can do all this really before we cut the bone or prepare the bone. And then once we've decided the optimal position for one patient, which might be quite different from person to person, um, we can then reproduce that. So it's a, it's a precise bone preparation tool that has different attachments, whether it's a, what we call a reamer, a burr, or a saw. And additionally, during the surgery, we get objective data on leg length, what we call offset, that would be the width, and in the knee, how much motion there is, how much ligament laxity there is, Traditionally, we've done these things very subjectively. So this is, gives us really um, good data, feedback, and real surgery to optimize the operation. So uh, in a nutshell, that's what, what it does. It, it involves a number of steps. Uh, I think Dr. Beamer's talk was over a little bit more of that. 
But that in a nutshell is what this is. It's a tool that we use. It's very different from the DaVinci or soft tissue uh, robots out there. Okay. So it's available, as I said, for uh, multiple different procedures. Um, it started about 15 years ago. Uh, at that time, it was available just for partial knee replacement. It's evolved now to evolve partial knee replacement of any of the three compartments, inside of the knee, outside of the knee, or the front of the knee, which would be the patelliform compartment. Uh, the next evolution was hip replacement. That's been out for nine or 10 years. It's available for both the anterior approach and posterior approach, which are the two main approaches. And then a little over five years ago, uh, total knee uh, came out. And um, I think it, it's got excellent uh, track record with these, these three different types of procedures. So here again goes over the history I just spoke of. I think those dates are maybe a year further along now uh, than when the slide was made. Um, but again, there's a lot of, uh, of you, it's been used very extensively. And I think in the uh, striker data now, about half of all their joint replacements are done with the robot. So our history um, goes back actually before 2016, I think 2014 or 2015, Dr. Damon and I became very interested in this and we had to convince our partners that this was a good uh, idea. And we did, and we purchased our first robot in our outpatient surgery center in Muncie. And we've been doing uh, robotic hip and knee procedures there since 2016. Um, the second robot occurred or was obtained actually by Ascension St. Vincent's in Fishers. And we're going on our third year there. Um, the third robot is our other surgery center at uh, Central Indiana Orthopedics Fishers, which is close to the hospital. And we have about a year and a half there. And then the last or fourth robot that we use in our group uh, came just last year in the late summer at St. Vincent's Anderson Hospital. Um, I think a couple months ago, we passed our thousandth joint uh, as a group. And uh, I think, you know, an, the number and interest of my partners has grown and the number and interest of our patients continues to grow. So what are the advantages? So again, as I, I spoke earlier, it allows us to individualize different components in either hip or knee surgery that, that address both the patient's bony and soft tissue anatomy, rather than doing the procedure the same way we do for everyone. These changes are relatively small. There are a few degrees of angle, maybe a change in size, um, depth, those types of things. And we can move in six degrees of freedom, any one of the components and optimize motion and balance of the knee, motion and balance of the hip. Um, there are also constraints built into the robot that doesn't allow us, or the robot basically shuts off if for any reason uh, the bone moves, the saw moves, the instruments move, and if it goes outside the guidelines, it just stops. And this results in less soft tissue damage. I think it's been pretty well established and uh, generally a lower risk of complications. Uh, for example, in hip replacement, there was a study that showed same surgeon, his last 100 cases with total hip before the robot and after the robot, this location risk went down. And it does allow very precise bone preparation. And many times we end up removing less bone because we can see what's gonna happen uh, ahead of time. So, so I guess the next, next thing we're gonna talk about is what, what is joint pain? What are treatment options? A little bit about joint replacement surgery. I'll cover hip, Dr. Dame will cover knee, and then We'll cover recovery expectations, which are quite variable from person to person, um, and then some question and answer period. So, so our lower extremity joints is here what we're talking about, but all of our joints involved in many activities, right? We walk, we bike, we hike, we swim, we lift weights. Um, and the hip and knee are involved basically in, in all of these activities and can result in significant limitations in our quality of life, ability to do things. And our goal is to restore that quality of life. So as we get an arthritic hip or knee, we're gonna find that we can't do what we wanna do. We end up you know, trying some conservative care. If that's not adequate and the disease is bad enough, that's when we talk about surgery. So different causes of joint pain. Rheumatoid arthritis used to be a very common reason for joint replacement. 
back when I trained 35 years ago when I started training. It's now very rare. It still happens, but the new medications modify the disease of rheumatoid arthritis and generally protect the cartilage pretty well. Osteoarthritis is the wear and tear kind of arthritis, and that's the majority of our patients. And then post-traumatic arthritis would be something like a, a major ligament injury or fracture, and that leads to osteoarthritis because of the damage to the joint. So non-surgical treatments, I'm not sure I put them in exactly this order, but um, we generally start with people try activity modifications, uh, and that would include up to walking aids, those types of things, uh, anti-inflammatories and Tylenol, heat or cold, some either home exercises or therapy to strengthen the muscles around the joint. And then when those things aren't working, then we can try some injections. And if those are not working, then the patients are still significantly impaired, that's when surgery is offered. Now, you obviously you have to have enough arthritis if that's appropriate. Um, many patients that present to us have already gone through most if not all of these uh, courses. If they haven't, then we go back and start uh, uh, conservative care. So when you come in to, to see, or if you're thinking about seeing someone like uh, Dr. Damer or I, you know, the, the different questions um, we might ask you or you might ask yourself. I think number one is, are you less active because of joint pain? And does the joint pain keep you from doing things you wanna do? Walk as far, exercise, uh, that type of thing. And then more specific questions, Sometimes, particularly in the hip, you can have trouble getting a good night's sleep, less so with the knee. And stairs are, are, can be a great difficulty. Activities day living, reaching your foot, to put your shoes and socks on and off, those types of things, getting around the house, et cetera. So in the hip, if those questions were positive and we had gone through all the conservative care and we have substantial or severe arthritis, then you come in and talk, we would start with an x-ray. So this is an x-ray of the drawing, but on your left side is a healthy hip with the cartilage over the femoral head, looks smooth, that's that white ball. And then on the right side, you can see it's got the pink and the damaged cartilage, and that's on the top of the femur. Femoral head is the part that is damaged and the socket, which is called the acetabulum, which is part of the pelvis. Oh, there it is, there's the hip. So this is histology, that's a microscopic anatomy slide. Um, so this is a magnified view of normal cartilage at the top. So normal cartilage has a membrane, a little bit of cells, and a lot of different proteins that gather water. And when you put your weight down, cartilage actually squishes down a little bit, the water is pushed out, and then you take your weight off, the water rushes back in. And that works as kind of a shock absorber along with the flexibility of the bone below. As we get arthritis, a number of things happen and that can be from an injury. It generally does increase with age. Obesity is a factor. Sometimes we have a bowed or a knee or something like that. And then the cartilage breaks down. So there's the slide below. So the pink stuff below is the bone. The cartilage doesn't have that membrane anymore. And you can see these big crevices. There's a slide again in Dr. Damer's talk where you can actually look at this through a, a camera. But in addition to losing that water flow in and out from the membrane and the tissue damage, the bone is also gets more rigid and that puts more stress in the cartilage. So once this process starts, it's going to continue. And we really don't have much, if anything, that we can do to slow it down. Sometimes weight loss can do that. But once arthritis is present, it's going to kind of progress at its own rate for that individual. So here's progression. So we have a normal hip or close to normal hip on your left and a severely arthritic hip on the right. If you look at the left slide, the ball is the round part and then there's a curved area near the top and there's a space there. That space is filled with articular cartilage, which actually is the same tissue you'd see on the end of a chicken leg. It's clear on x-ray, it doesn't have any calcium. So you see the bone, you don't see the cartilage. To your right, where it says arthritic hip, you can see the bones touching. There are cysts, the bone is deformed, and the ball isn't normally located in the socket. Next. So 
So here's a series of x-rays, again, starting from low-grade arthritis on your left, progressing, and you can see the joint space narrow until it's almost completely gone to the right. Next. So how a total hip works. This is an active slide, and it's going to show you some anatomy. They peel off the skin. They're not going to peel off the muscles. We don't actually do that. Uh, we make a decision and get down to this area. So the ball has been removed. The socket has been replaced. It's lined typically with plastic. The femur is hollow and the stem is placed and then a ball, usually ceramic now, and the hip is re-articulated. So let's stay on this slide for a second when it's done. So when we do this robotically, in addition to making the decision and, and the things you saw in diagram, we're also going to use a little probe, and that's demonstrated the knee, to localize the bone and match that to our CT scan. And once those things match, some cameras watch, and then the robot knows exactly where things are. So we can change the angle uh, or depth of the cup, um, those types of things on both our preparation of the bone and fixation, and we can use those diagrams also to help us on the femoral side prepare the bone there. Okay, next. So here's another slide, shows the implant already in place. Um, I think at the bottom it says at that time there had been more than 300 placed with the robot, I believe. And that's what um, a model of bone would look like with hip replacement done. There's two approaches that we use for most of us. Uh, booster approach is the incision on the side. And then Dr. Damer and I, most of the time, use an anterior approach, which we will talk about shortly. Anterior means the front. So here is an x ray with the hip in place, showing good component position, nice symmetric compared to the other hip. Should have a happy patient. Okay. So there's the different components. Um, all total hips have a socket. That socket is attached to the bone. It's a porous metal for almost all patients, and the bone actually grows in. And then there's either a plastic liner, occasionally a metal liner, placed. The stem is also metal. Uh, it's a titanium in this case. The rough area is where the bone grows in, and then we have the pink is the ball, and that's, again, typically ceramic, and either articulates with a plastic or has plastic attached to the top of it. So muscle sparring approaches, here's where we're going to talk about the anterior approach hip, which is the way we, I perform probably about 90% of my primary total. So incisions in the front, DAA um, is one of the terms that's used, but basically it's, it's an incision in the front. And instead of going splitting muscle, it goes between muscles. So it does potentially minimize any soft tissue impact. It's a relatively small incision. And I described two advantages to this approach when I talk to a patient. There's pretty well documented that the first six weeks or so compared to other hip approaches, patients recover faster, have less discomfort, and get further along the course of activity compared to an average of the other incision. And the second is that there's a little bit lower risk of dislocation. That's the ball coming out of socket. Um, that can happen when something impinges. And by that, I mean, the femur moves up and maybe the prosthesis hits the edge of the cup or bone hits bone or when it goes extends or goes backward. So the, the direct anterior approach preserves a lot of the soft tissue and envelope in the back, presenting, preventing or reducing risk of posterior dislocation. But as I said earlier, the robot also allows us further reduction of this risk by being able to move the hip through space before we put the implants in and try to find the best position for components in that patient. A lot of this has to do with where the pelvis is relative to the spine. It can be quite different from one person to another when they're standing or they're sitting down, and therefore the right position for person A may be very wrong for person B. <clears throat> so I am gonna turn it over to Dr. Damer. Until those questions, I'll come back. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. Right. So, We'll start talking about uh, knees now. We'll shift a little bit and start looking at uh, knee replacements and the different uh, uh, 
uh, types of uh, uh, surgeries from there and how the Mako Robotics uh, works with that. Uh, this the slide is just a representation of uh, uh, the knee, looking at it from the front. On the left side, we can see a quote, normal, healthy looking knee. On the right, the red demonstrates area where there's some loss of cartilage on the end of the femur, or the thigh bone. Uh, we can see the kneecap, that's kind of the circular uh, bone that's in the front there, and then the tibia, the shin bone down below. Next. <clears throat> this is a, an x-ray, actual x-ray representation of how the knee will look. So this, again, is uh, get you oriented. We're looking from the front on both of these x-rays. Uh, the x-ray on the left is uh, what we'd call, quote, normal, kind of healthy uh, looking knee. We can see the joint space in between the two bones. That's that dark area between the, uh, uh, the thigh bone and the tibia there. Uh, that space is where the cartilage would be. As, our, as the arthritic process uh, starts taking hold and we start losing that uh, the structure of the cartilage, the cartilage starts to wear down. Eventually, that space in between wears down to where we're seeing bone against bone. And that's the x-ray we're seeing on the right. As Dr. Grable uh, talked about earlier, there's lots of causes for this, such as the rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, um, post-traumatic. So after an injury, this can speed up this, product, this process of the cartilage degrading. Uh, obesity is another one of those. And as we look from a, just strictly a mechanical standpoint uh, for, the, for the knee, for every pound you lose, and I like to think of this in 10 pound increments. So for every 10 pounds you lose, it takes 40 pounds of pressure off your knee as you're going from a seated to standing position and, and or going up and down stairs and movements. So it's uh, um, uh, weight loss does, uh, does make a difference from a joint standpoint. Next. So this is looking at uh, the knee uh, on the left. So this is looking through a knee arthroscopy, so a knee scope. This is looking directly at the bones. The, on the left picture, we're seeing the end of the femur. That's the round, uh, uh, the round white feature we're seeing there. It looks like an egg. And that's what normal healthy cartilage looks like. Just a nice smooth eggshell appearance to it. Uh, when there's good lubricating joint fluid in there, that's more slick than even ice. Uh, it's very, uh, very good design to it. And uh, that's what a normal healthy knee would look like. As we saw with Dr. Grable's slide on the histology of cartilage, as that cartilage starts to degrade and break down, now we start to see the picture on the right as we're looking directly at it. Up in the upper uh, half of that picture, that's the round surface, the end of the bone. But we can see, we don't see the nice white smooth cartilage. We're actually seeing some kind of uh, peach beige and kind of pink look, and that's the exposed bone underneath. The cartilage has worn down. Uh, in, in this particular case, we're seeing now the what's called subchondral bone, but we're seeing the bone uh, exposed. Uh, and we can imagine on that x-ray, this is why we start seeing the bones coming together. We can imagine on the floor of that picture, the cartilage starting to lose starting to lose the cartilage there as well. Uh, side note, this also has a pretty bad meniscus tear and that's very common with arthritis to have the cartilage ring in there, the meniscus to have that tear as that's also degrading with the degenerative arthritis. Next. <clears throat> arthritis is a, 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 pro a progressive disease. It's a progressive degenerative changes that occur. Uh, this is kind of uh, three x-rays showing the progression there from the left to the right. Left, we see the normal joint uh, uh, with the nice black space in between, that joint space in between. In the middle, that's starting to degrade. We see one side starting to wear down, just about down to that bone against bone as that cartilage is softening. And then on the right side is where we start to see we are down to bone against bone. And the bone even starts to change shape again a little bit and starting to flatten out some because of the abnormal stresses going across. We start developing bone spurs, which are a response to that abnormal stress. Uh, we start seeing that on x-rays as well. Next. So this will be a, a pictorial uh, uh, kind of description or show how a, um, a total knee works. We remove all the skin, remove all the muscles. Uh, that'd be bad surgery, but uh, no. So we get down to the bone. We take this, it takes all, and we form the end of the bone to, to the um, uh, position and basically resurface the knee. I like to think of total knees as more of a resurfacing of the knee. 
Uh, as Dave touched on before, there's three compartments of the knee and a total knee resurfaces the ends of both bones and places a plastic liner in between. All right, next. This is a, a, a artist's rendition of what a partial knee on the left and a total knee replacement on the right. It's a little bit hard to see, but we can see a little bit of kind of the silver uh, shimmer on the uh, left picture on the one compartment, and that's where it's resurfacing for a partial knee replacement. Uh, on the left, or I'm sorry, on the right side now, we can see the, uh, um, uh, the implants in place, the silver shine, and that's uh, what we're looking at what we're looking at for a total knee replacement with that white plastic liner in between. At the, at the bottom there, you can see uh, rough estimates. Uh, um, I'm not sure what year this was, but roughly 600,000 knee replacements performed each year in the US. Uh, it's a pretty significant number. Next. <clears throat> so as I just mentioned, we can think of the knee as in three compartments. We uh, talk about the medial, which would be the inside part lateral, which would be the outside part, and the patella femoral, which is the front part of the knee. Uh, these three compartments, when we do partial knee replacements, if we have isolated arthritis, as we see in the top view, kind of the artist rendition of, of where the um, uh, red and the blue is, is, where the destroyed cartilage is. So if we have a very isolated area of cartilage loss and uh, it's maintained in the one compartment, a partial knee replacement can be a nice option to resurface that portion of the knee. Uh, we can even get pretty fancy with this and do two, uh, two compartments with these. Uh, once we start getting into three compartments, you're better off with a total knee replacement. Next. This is an x-ray view and what a, of both a partial and a total knee replacement. I'm going to um, have you look to the right on the total knee x-ray. If we look at the two images there, the one on the right is the side view of the knee. Again, we can see how this is, uh, the white is the metal, and that we can see how it resurfaces the ends of the bone. Um, we remove approximately about um, 8 to 10 millimeters of bone off the end of the bone, and that gets resurfaced with the metal. Then there's a plastic liner that's placed in between. Uh, and not pictured on this, but typically we'll resurface the backside of the kneecap as well with the plastic liner. So that way there's plastic against the metal there as well. Uh, but that's a, a view of a total knee replacement. If we look over to the left x-ray, uh, we can see the white in just one small portion of the knee. And that's a picture, an x-ray of a partial knee replacement. You can see how it's just resurfacing that inside part of the knee where the, the bad arthritis was. You can see the outside part of the knee, the lateral, clear to the left, there's still a good joint space there. So that's well maintained and that has been left alone in that particular type of surgery. Next. <clears throat> Here's a more of a photographic kind of look at what the implants look like, uh, the different types of uh, uh, implants. Uh, on the right side is the total knee replacement. Uh, this, this picture is actually showing one of the newer technologies, and that's a press fit total knee replacement where uh, the bone actually grows into the implant. Typically, uh, the tradition was a total knee replacement was uh, the implants are cemented into place, um, and that's great for initial stability. Long term, there's always a risk of that cement loosening, loosening or debonding from the implant. On the right, though, we can see this um, roughened surface allows for bone to grow into it. And in theory, then long term, that, that uh, bond can continue to remodel and grow as the stresses are felt and uh, try to maintain a long, longer longevity of the implant itself. Next. <clears throat> Specific to the uh, striker total knee replacement called the triathlon, that's the name of the uh, implant. Uh, this has a, what's called a single radius uh, um, uh, knee design. It's supposed to help give a more natural like uh, circular motion and rolling back of the knee as you bend the knee. You may re recall, I think it was probably seven, eight years ago, maybe more, uh, there were commercials that were seeing quite a bit of people trying to ride bicycles with oblong wheels and use records that were oblong or balls that were um, um, oval shape. That's what this was, uh, that was their uh, commercial and what they're referring to is the circular side of it and to try to help with maintaining stability through the motion as well as uh, um, helping uh, increase motion. Next. 
the, um, next, we'll kind of start talking about uh, the medical smart robotics. Um, and this is a, a fascinating area for me. I believe this is a, um, probably one of the uh, uh, newer technologies in my mind that may, is going to make a big difference from a total knee standpoint. It gives me much more information when I'm in surgery, as we'll be able to see here in a bit. And as a surgeon, the more information I can have, the better I feel as far as giving you, the patient, the most optimal outcome. Next. We can see there's uh, quite a bit of data uh, for the um, MAKO ro uh, smart robotics. Uh, as was pointed out by Dr. Grable earlier, it's been used for quite some time with partial knee replacements. Uh, this is, shows a much quicker recovery uh, in several of the studies. Um, and better preservation of uh, healthy bones. Uh, total hip was the next application to come along with that. And some of the studies are demonstrating a, a more natural feel to the hip, uh, more accurate placement. And I think uh, Dr. Grable touched on the fact of we can start uh, um, personalizing the position of the implants and how the pelvis is moving in, in space with standing, sitting, and laying down positions. That's something that you just couldn't do before this kind of technology to really be able to uh, see that movement and know what our best range, our best position would be to try to avoid implant impingement. On the left then, we start seeing the total knee replacement and that's the newer application for the robotics for this uh, MAKO uh, smart robotics. And uh, surveys and studies are now showing that at the six month mark, it does seem to lower the pain scores. Um, some of that is maybe attributed to better um, uh, protection of the soft tissues as we'll, we'll demonstrate here in a bit. Uh, next. <clears throat> some of the statistics of the smart robotics. Uh, this was updated uh, last year, uh, looking at over a thousand systems that have been uh, installed across uh, 29 countries and in, and in every state in the United States. 450,000 plus uh, MAKO robotic uh, procedures have been performed. And this is again, over the experience over 15 years with the, um, uh, the different uh, um, configurations we can use. Next. Next, this will be a video demonstrating how MAKO robotic works. Uh, once you've uh, um, decided on a surgery, you'll obtain a CT scan of the hip or knee. On this particular video, that we'll be looking at a total knee replacement. So you obtain the CT scan. A CT scan is a, a series of images can, that can then be uh, placed together in, in the computer and come up with a virtual image. This will give us a three-dimensional virtual model of your exact anatomy. We can then load that into the system and come up with a personalized plan for your implants. We know the sizing, we know the positioning, maybe what some bony defects are. We can make some fine-tuned adjustments and we can do this all before even stepping, room, uh, stepping into the operating room. Once we uh, like the plan and we're into the surgery, we expose the bone and using this probe, we then identify marks on the ends of the bones, both the tibia and femur, and uh, develop a 3D model as the computer generates this. That 3D model of your exact anatomy we're looking at then matches up and we verify this matches exactly with the CT model. Once we have that, we can now start tensioning the ligaments. We can see how those implants, they're going to react in the joint, how the joint's going to respond to that uh, and tension the ligaments properly. We can fine tune adjust that in surgery before we've made any cuts. Once we're pleased with that, we bring in the make a robotic arm. I'm in control of this the entire time, but what happens is it keeps the saw in the very precise uh, cut, cutting plane, and then also has virtual boundaries, which helps protect the soft tissues and keeps that saw blade from going outside of those boundaries. Uh, once we've removed that diseased bone, we can then place the implants uh, the implants, once we're pleased with that, we'll get you over to recovery room and then off to uh, physical therapy to get that knee working properly. This process is very similar for partial knee replacements as well as the um, total hip replacements as well. But uh, as far as getting the sequence of the CT scan, the preoperative plan, being able to map it with your exact anatomy and then personalizing that at the end. And we can see those steps here on this, uh, this particular um, uh, slide. Uh, to me, that's one of the benefits. Again, as a surgeon, I like that extra information. Being able to come walk into the operating room, having already seen 
maybe how the implant needs to be slightly positioned for your exact anatomy because maybe there's a bone defect we need to avoid or maybe there's a, a, um, a difference in how your bone morphology is and we need to adjust it so we can get the proper fit to your knee or to your bone uh, depending on the surgery we're doing. Next. Once we've established this, uh, if you can look at the fine details of the numbers here, what this is, this is the data that I'm receiving in surgery. We get our pre-balanced adjustments. This is, bef again, before we've made any, any uh, um, cuts, we can make all these fine-tuned adjustments and get the numbers that are going to be appropriate for your specific knee. Uh, allows us to see what the gaps are, and we can fine-tune those, those motions within safe positions adjust the implant position to account for that. Next. <clears throat> picture of the, this is a picture of the screen for total hip replacement. Uh, you can see the, the um, kind of neon green uh, view. That's a, a view that I see when I'm starting to do uh, the reaming for the acetabular, the cup side. This allows us to see the bone that needs to be removed. We can see on the left small box, it's a CT scan, the actual your CT scan that I'm visualizing to be able to see what bone needs to be removed and how much. And then from there, the robotic arm guides my hand and keeps that reamer in the exact position for the reaming. So we know exactly within a half millimeter to a millimeter where your cup is gonna be. When we place the cup, then it's gonna get us within a, a degree of motion and the different ways that we look at how that uh, um, cup position needs to be specifically for your anatomy. Next. Recovery after total joint replacement. Uh, as you talk, even with friends and family, you're going to find out that there's a wide variety on how patients recover afterwards. It's very much a mindset too, of just really being able to um, uh, have a goal in mind that uh, matches with what the surgeon's telling you and what we're talking through and, and getting you aligned with the physical therapist that will help you attain that goal. After surgery, like I said, typically we're going to get you into uh, formal physical therapy or at home care to help through that. Uh, for me personally, a, a typical is a pay, the surgeon or uh, one of their um, uh, Extenders will uh, see you at the follow-up visit at two weeks, and then I'll typically see patients back at the six-week mark, and then uh, six months, and then one year. These are all time-sensitive uh, times as we're looking at whether wound healing or making sure you're, get, you're obtaining the motion um, in a, a, a timely fashion or mobilities uh, occurring. And then it also allows us to check x-rays at that six-month and one-year mark to make sure implants are, st are stable on the bone. Next, recovery times from person to person will vary quite a bit. Uh, these are surgeries that typically our patients are going home the next day. We do have some patients that are uh, going home the same day with the same day surgery from either a surgery center or at a hospital where you can have yours come in in the morning, have the surgery, and then if you have help at home, be able to get you home for the appropriate patient. Typically, patients are getting back to their normal activities roughly around that um, three to six week mark. Um, you'll still see improvement on up to a year out, especially with strength and stamina. Um, but uh, that's uh, kind of a rough idea on recovery after uh, a replacement. Next. Recovery also, our goal is to get you back to doing what you love. So there's a reason we're doing this surgery and that's to help um, uh, with your uh, ability to return back to the activities you need to be doing or want to be doing. Uh, and that can include all those below uh, and, and even more obviously, but uh, you should be able to get back to uh, most all of your activities next. There are some restrictions that we put on and these are relative restrictions. For me personally, I usually simplify it and just say, try to avoid any types of running and jumping activities. We're dealing with a mechanical device now with plastics and metals and ceramics, and there's a chance for that to wear. And so the goal uh, post-operatively is to try to get this knee or hip to last as long as we can. I usually joke with patients, if you're getting chased, run, it'll do it. I'm just trying to limit the day-to-day uh, -day impacts of, of the running and jumping activities. If there's some activities that you just need to do, we talk about the, uh, the um, uh, 
uh, we talk about that. And if I need to sign back in. So I tell people, if you have to run away from a bear, feel free to I'm run sorry. away from a bear. But running for exercise is always the best idea. I've, I've actually had two knees done um, yeah. with the makeup, and uh, I'm very, very active. I've been a runner forever, and I haven't gone back to running because I'm concerned about just what Brent was talking about. The repetitive impact um, probably or may result in earlier failure of implants. Yeah. Sorry about that, my computer timed out there. Oh, so. no problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and, and along that lines, all patients that, especially like with hips that were uh, um, professional referees or, or things where <clears throat> they need to stay in shape and some of their activities require some running. And so I usually talk to them about just try to avoid the impacts on your off time. So cross train more, getting on the bike to keep your cardio up. And then those times you need to run, you do it, but uh, it's just uh, trying to limit the uh, impacts activities. So. Yeah. Okay. It's question time. Yeah. <laughs> Ayla, so, what do we have for questions? Yeah, so we'll give attendees a couple minutes to submit questions using their Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. Um, but I thought we'd go through a couple uh, questions while we're waiting. Um, these are common questions that we get asked by patients um, leading up to a joint replacement. And so the first one, Dr. Grable, I'll give to you. How will I know when I'm ready for joint replacement surgery? So uh, I've been through it personally in addition to doing many, many thousands of these. So I think it's a good question for me to answer. Um, so what I tell people is that when you can't do the things you wanna do anymore, despite um, you know, maximum medical management and you have advanced arthritis, that's a reasonable time to consider hip or knee replacement. So, you know, if you've done anti-inflammatories, maybe you've done shots um, and that's not enough and you find yourself becoming less able to do things. If you let this go too far, uh, then people become debilitated and then it's very hard to get that back. So really before that happens is when people should strongly consider it. There's a few people that come in, they still seem to be functioning pretty well, but they'll have just a horrible x-ray where they're losing bone in some of those situations, we'll steer the patient, but I think about 95% of the time it's the patient's desire to be able to do more that leads them to this pathway. Okay, and then next question uh, for Dr. Damer is anyone needing a hip or knee replacement a candidate for Mako surgery? Yeah, so when we're looking at who's a, a good candidate for a Mako robotic uh, uh, surgery, that's a, uh, it's a good question, Kayla. So as we look at this, realistically, everyone can be a candidate. There are a few exceptions, and just because of uh, logistics of where we need to place pins, if there happens to be hardware or if their body habitus is such that we aren't able to position the uh, uh, pins properly, this would, in my mind, probably be the only true restriction on that. Other, uh, probably one other I've had is there was enough hardware in there, the CT scan, the quality was not sufficient enough to be able to uh, to, to get a good uh, CT scan to work from. And when I'm saying hardware, that means from a previous surgery, maybe multiple plates and screws um, from a previous fracture. Uh, those would be times that it's gonna be very kind of case dependent on if it could be done. Realistically though, there's, there's not many uh, um, kind of, uh, not many restrictions on that to be able to use it. Dave, do you run into any others that you can think of? No, and, and we have a, actually a question on the screen that's very yeah. similar to this question. So I would say I have not, not been able to do anybody at this point. Um, I do sometimes remove some hardware beforehand, but particularly obviously if it's gonna be in the way and that I think takes a little bit of the artifact off. Um, we've even done some partial knee conversions to total knee. I think you've done that yep. too. Yep. Um, I had one where the, the data was a little bit off uh, I think it was a because um, the metal was a little thicker. It was a patellofemoral implant, but even then, once I took that that implant off, I was able to register enough other bone that we could still do it. So I really haven't run into a situation where we couldn't. 
Yeah, and along that same lines, I've found that even with people who have plates and screws in place, the Maker Robotics, having that CT scan ahead of time has really helped and be able to limit the amount of um, uh, screws that we have to remove or placement of our, our implants. And we can do that fine-tune adjustment and know exactly where those screws are and either find them easier with use of the guidance with its buried mm -hmm. bone or avoid it all altogether with placement of our implants. So agree. Yeah. Okay. We have one more question. Yep. And then the last question: Can the surgery be performed outpatient? And if so, are all patients candidates? Uh, so I'll take that one. Um, I've had it done that way. Um, so I would. I think that many patients are candidates for outpatient, and we're the, the number is is growing gradually as um, anesthesia gets more comfortable. Um, I think Brent, when we started doing outpatients a little about five and a half years ago, we were uh, really looking at really pretty young people with no medical problems at all, yeah. and uh, we've gradually extended that into people in the Medicare range um, and people with some medical issues. So I think you need to have good support at home. You've got to be able to walk at least moderately well before surgery. So if you're barely able to get around on the walker, you're not a candidate really to be doing this an outpatient going home the same day. Um, there are some insurance restrictions. Some insurance plans uh, don't um, qualify and some patients don't qualify. But I think, you know, we're getting to the point where a significant fraction of patients can do it this way. And I think they project, I think by 2025, that it may be as high as 50%. percent not sure it'll quite get there, but but a very substantial portion. What do you think, Brent? Yeah, I would agree with that. As, as we, uh, as, as anyone, any surgery, even as we look back to how ACLs used to be performed and having to uh, stay in the hospital for a few days, and now virtually every ACL uh, reconstruction is done as an outpatient. I don't think total joints are going to get quite to that level like you're indicating as well. Uh, but yet in the same sense that we start getting more comfortable and understanding on how patients uh, and patient selection is the most important part of that and who can come through. Along with that, anesthesiologists, as you touched on, Dave, are also kind of coming up with better ways to help prove help with that pain control post-operatively, help with decreasing the nausea and vomiting and kind of the cognitive aspect of coming to right after a surgery and being able to uh, uh, dismiss home. So, yeah. I think you, just in the five and a half years we've been doing this, they've gotten yeah. the, you know, with it. With oh, it. definitely, yeah. definitely. Back when I trained, all the rotator cuff patients stayed in the hospital for three days. Sure. <laughs> and by the time I started to practice, Nobody stayed at the hospital <laughs> at all. <laughs> it was all go oh, straight home. So things, Times things have changed. Sometimes pretty <laughs> rapidly. Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> okay. Well, I do not see any more questions. So um, as I mentioned earlier, if you're a registered attendee, then I will be sending out an email after the webinar. So feel free to follow up with me if you have any questions that come up. Or you can always comment on our Facebook Live video and we will get back to you. So thank you for attending the webinar and have a great evening. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Yeah.